I think it's about time for a semester overview. Semester overview, semester overview. So first we talked about ethics and why it's important to be ethical when you're doing data analysis. Then we talked about the scientific method and how measurement is critical to the scientific method. And then we spent quite a bit of time talking about visualization. So what is this video about? This video is about assumptions or identifying characteristics that might screw up our data analysis. Now let me say in advance though, this video is not about how to fix those things that screw up your data analysis. Unfortunately. That is an advanced topic that I cover in the multivariate class. Ah, shucks, I hate it when that happens. Me too, there's just not enough time to explain how to fix these problems when we encounter them. So with that, residuals. What's a residual? Great question, glad you asked. A residual is what is left over after we fit a model to our data. Oh boy, what's a model? Mathematically and statistics, we're gonna use the general linear model, which is represented as y is equal to b0 plus b1 x plus e. Oh, I'm so confused right now. Hey, chill, it's all good. Let me make this a little bit more simple. Y is equal to fit plus error. Oh, that simplified things. I sure hope so, man. So our statistical models are broken down into two components, those parts that we can fit or those parts that we can model, and then error, those parts that we can't model. Or if we were to use simple algebra, we could reverse things a little bit and say that error is your actual score minus your fitted score. So a residual is what was not fit. A residual is the difference between what we predicted your score would be and what your actual score is. And it turns out that residuals are like super informative. They can tell us if we missed anything in our model. They can tell us if our data are normally distributed. That's kind of important. And just because it's important, I'm gonna say it again. Error is equal to y, which is your score, my score, everybody's score, minus fit. You can think about this visually. So if we're looking at categorical data, so here might be your score, and this right here is the mean. And visually speaking, the residual is the distance from the mean to your score. Simple enough, right? That's all a residual is, and everybody has their own residual. Unless we happen to predict you perfectly, in which case, you have no residual. So that's with numeric variable, or that's with, that's with categorical variables. How about numeric variables? Simple enough. So here is a score, and then here is the predicted score for that person, and the difference between those is the residual. And notice that, once again, everybody has a residual. Again, unless we predict your score perfectly. So why all this talk of residuals, you might ask? Residuals help us to identify whether our model is behaving as it ought to. Because look guys, eventually we're gonna start computing numbers. We're gonna start making inferences about our data from these numbers. We're gonna start making critical decisions that rely on these numbers. And wouldn't it suck if we relied on data and we relied on a model that was just dead wrong? So inferences and numbers and all these decisions we make based on our data are only meaningful if our model is approximately correct. Technical side note. No model is correct. Some models are dead wrong and some models are pretty much wrong. And some models are close, but wrong. So look guys, we're just looking for a good approximation to the correct model, even though there is no correct model, but we just don't wanna be deceived and think that a really, really bad model is actually the right model to use. So assumptions help us know if our model is good enough. And there are four critical assumptions we make in the general linear model. And by the way, we're going to spend an entire video or two or three or 10 talking about what the general linear model is. In short, it's just what we saw earlier. Y is equal to B0 plus B1 times X plus E. It's just simple algebra, folks, you know it. We saw Y is equal to AX plus B or MX plus B. Same thing, guys, except we use B1 and B0 and we add an E there. That's all it is. That's the general linear model. But the general linear model makes four critical assumptions. Number one, normality. Number two, homoskedasticity. <laughs> That's a funny word. You bet it is. Number three, independence. Number four, linearity. First, normality. We assume the residuals are normally distributed. If data are super skewed like this, the mean is no longer representative. The mean ain't the right model, folks. And it turns out most statistics we use rely on the mean 
to model data. Second, homoscedasticity. Oh, that's a good word, isn't it? Say what? All that really means is that the spread is about the same across all levels of X. Yeah, that didn't help at all. You wanna see a visual? Yeah, I think that'll help. So here we have a categorical example. People in the control group score very, very close to the mean. Whereas people in the treatment group, they are all over the place. This is a prime example of what we call heteroskedasticity which means that the spread around the fit of the model is not the same across all the levels of X or all the levels of your predictor variable. Okay, I think I get it. And here's an example with regression. Notice that for low values of X, we are fitting the model quite well. We are very able to predict those who have low scores on X, but the higher up you get, the more uncertain we are about what these individual scores are. So the residuals get larger as X gets larger. And why is this a problem, you ask? That means there's something going on here that you have missed. Why is the treatment group all over the place while the control group isn't? You have missed something there in your model and you need additional information in order to capture that. So again, it just means you've got the wrong model or at least an incomplete model. And by the way, this will make a little bit more sense when we start talking about what a variance is, what a standard deviation is, but you can think of it as uncertainty. So once again, homoskedasticity means we are equally certain across all the levels of X, whereas heteroskedasticity means we are more uncertain with certain values of X. Assumption number three, independence. What the f I know, it's crazy, but hold up, just one minute. Independence simply means that one person's score will not influence another person's score, or that different people's scores will not be related. Generally, this is gonna happen. Whatever Bob answers in Illinois isn't gonna influence what I do here in New Jersey. But it ain't always that easy. For example, if you measure me twice on day one and day two, my scores are no longer independent because what I said yesterday is going to be correlated or related or predicted predictive of what I'm gonna say today. And likewise, if you measure my two amazing brothers and my awesome sister, guess what? Their scores are probably gonna be similar to mine. Why is that, you ask? Hello, these awesome Fife genes, they're in me, they're in them. Of course we're gonna measure the same. Not to mention the fact that we like talking stuff and what I say to my brothers influences their thinking, what they say to me influences my thinking, and what my sister says to me influences what I say, and my sister's opinions influence my opinions, and my parents' opinions influence all of us. So likely, we are not gonna be independent. So it turns out independence is actually a very important assumption that we cannot violate. If we do, it's gonna screw everything up. But fortunately, it's really a design issue. If you're not collecting information from the same person multiple times, or if you're not measuring siblings or twins or couples or whatever, generally it doesn't happen. And if it does happen, it doesn't mean you're screwed, it just means you need to choose a different model, and that's okay. And see the link in the description for how to model that sort of data. So, so far we got normality, homoscedasticity, independence, and finally, linearity. And we've already talked about this, so you already know it. Linearity simply means that the fit of the model is straight. So here's what it looks like for categorical data. Hey, look at that. Guess what? We could fit a straight line between the means of these two groups. So it turns out that with categorical data, the assumption of linearity is always met because we could always fit a straight line between two groups. And here's what it looks like on a regression. The fit of the line is straight. If the fit bends at all like this, then we have violated the assumption of linearity. And again, like I said, assumptions are to make sure that we have not missed anything in our model. And so if you fit a straight line, and if the data are curved, that just means you missed the curve. It's okay. You just have to fit a different model, dude. Okay, so likely you might be confused right now. Okay, we were just talking about residuals, and now we're talking about assumptions. What the f it turns out the assumptions are about the residuals of the model, not about the variables themselves. Because again, the residuals tell us what we haven't fit. And if there's something important we haven't fit, then we need to fit it to make sure our model is correct enough. Or in other words, if your outcome variable is totally skewed like this, it may actually be okay. It may be that when you fit the model, the residuals become normal. So here's an example looking at the distribution of height, and lo and behold, it is bimodal. We know bimodal ain't a normal distribution. What the f 
Let's say we fit a model where we include gender as a predictor, and then lo and behold, the residuals are normal. How can that be? Because each of those modes represents the height of women, the height of men. So once you model men versus women, the residuals become normal. So if modeling our data made the residuals A-OK, -okay, then we good. All is well. So again, in short, the assumption is about the residuals, not about the variables themselves. So let's do a mid-video summary, shall we? We want to make sure the model is right. And to make sure the model is right, we make four assumptions. Normality, homoscedasticity, independence, and linearity. And if we violate one of those assumptions, that means we haven't fit something that we should have fit. So we look at the residuals. Why the residuals? Because they show us what remains after we fit the data. Oh boy, that was a concise and excellent summary. Isn't it great having yourself as a guest to inflate your own ego? Now, of course, before you even compute residuals, you actually have to fit a model. But this model that we're gonna fit is totally tentative. Why? Because we don't even know if the model is good yet. We have to look at the residuals. So we have to fit a model to get residuals, but we can't rely on that model to tell us anything informative. And so we fit a temporary model just to get residuals. Make sense? Let's go ahead and look at an example. Let's say we're returning to the exercise data set. We wanna see if weight loss can be predicted by group membership, or in other words, do the two groups yield different values of weight loss? So here is our bivariate visual showing the relationship between the two. And what we can do is we can extract the residuals from this plot and then look at the normality assumption. And here is the distribution of those re residuals. And what we're looking for, just like before in our univariate visualization, is we are looking for an approximate symmetrical distribution with no outliers, no skewness, no bimodality, no zero inflatedness, and that sort of thing. And if it's approximately symmetric and bell-shaped and that sort of thing, you're okay. If there's severe deviations, you're probably not okay. How do I know if it's enough to be a problem? That's an excellent question. I think sometimes that comes through experience, but even for those who are experienced, even then, what that generally means is you do a sensitivity analysis, which we'll talk about in the multivariate class. Normality, what about linearity? The best tool we have to assess the linearity assumption is a residual dependence plot. Now, of course, we can look at the scatter plot and look for kind of a bendiness in the data, and that's helpful. But a residual dependence plot is actually a little bit better. Why? Because in order to identify departures from a straight line, you have to kind of bend your head and look for a departure from a straight line. Well, what a residual dependence plot does for you is it just flattens that line. Care to see a visual? So here is just an animation of what a residual dependence plot is doing. It is taking the relationship between X and Y and just rotating that line so that it is flat. And what that does for you is it allows you to see whether any pattern remains in the data. Data. Does that make sense? A residual dependence plot just flattens the line for you and it makes it easier and more apparent if there is any deviation from a flat pattern. So to do this, we have on the x-axis the fit of the model, which for this class means the whatever predictor you're using, and on the y-axis is the residuals. And what are we looking for? We are looking for substantial curves or patterns in the data. Because remember, the residual dependence plot shows the residuals. And what are the residuals? They are what remains after we have fit the data. So after we fit the data, there shouldn't be anything left. You remember with a scatter plot, we are actually looking for an elliptical trend. We want to be able to have a line that is not flat. Well, with a residual dependence plot, we actually want the opposite. We want a flat line. Homoscedasticity! Remember that this means that the spread across the values of X or our certainty about how accurate we are should be consistent across all levels of X. The tool of choice to assess this is called an SL plot. S for spread, L for location. So here's an example of an SL plot. On the X axis, we have the fit of the model. On the Y axis, we have the absolute value of the residuals. Why? Because at this point, we don't really care about the direction of the residuals. We just want to know how big the residuals residuals are. And we want to know whether we are more uncertain at particular points of X than at others. So if we plot the absolute value of the residuals, it just tells us how uncertain we are regardless of whether it's positive or negative. If we become more uncertain at particular values of X, then we've got problems. What are we looking for? We are looking for flat lines. So if you look at this example, notice that if we were to fit a line between a line across the values of X, it is relatively flat. But in this situation, the lines ain't flat. We be in trouble, folks. So now let me do an end of the lecture summary. We want to know if our model is good. We want to know if we can trust our model to make decisions. In order to trust our models, the residuals, 
which mean what remains after we fit the data have to be normal, they have to be linear, they have to be homoscedastic, and they have to be independent. And we assess normality with histograms, we assess linearity with residual dependence plots, and we assess homoscedasticity with SL plots. Well, what about independence, huh? If you have problems with independence, you'll probably know about it, and you should be using different models anyway. And if what we didn't fit, the residuals have any sort of pattern, then we are in trouble. So with histograms, that means non-normality. With residual dependence plots, that means there's some sort of non-linearity or curviness in the plot. And with SL plots, that means there is a non-flat line. And next time,